come now to the 14th, no, the 13th presentation at the British Columbian Camp 1983, and this is the 2.30 meeting on Monday afternoon. We come back now to continue our consideration of the life story of Jacob as a type of the... Exp- pardon? Me. Was this 13 or... 13, yeah. Or 14? No, 13. It is 13. Yeah. We'll be right, yeah, 13 is correct. Yes. <coughs> Good, now I come back to page 196 and 197 in, in the book Patriarchs and Prophets to read further in regard to Jacob's experience and then to parallel this, of course, with the experience of God's folk in these last days. So we will learn what it means to fight against God during the time of Jacob's trouble. We saw in our state period this morning how the present... Uh, trend of events will mount the greatest problem which humanity has ever faced and how a united church claiming to have solved its own problems will claim thereby the right to solve all human problems and usher in the glorious and long expected golden millennium of peace and prosperity. We had begun to note the fact uh, in Patriarchs and Prophets 195 and 196 that Jacob still had not been completely cleansed from that disposition to do something himself to ensure his own protection and his own safety. I'll just read those words again on page 195. Yet Jacob felt that he had something to do to secure his own safety. He therefore dispatched messengers with a conciliatory greeting to his brother. He instructed them as to the exact words in which they were to address Esau. It had been foretold before the birth of the two brothers that the elder should serve the younger and lest the memory of this should be a cause of bitterness Jacob told the servants they were, to, they were sent to my lord Esau when brought before him they were to refer to their master as thy servant Jacob and to remove the fear that he was returning a destitute wanderer to claim the parental inheritance Jacob was careful to state in his message I have oxen and asses, flocks and men servants and women servants and I have sent to tell my Lord that I might find grace in your sight <clears throat> as I said before Jacob here was exhibiting the lack of total and complete faith in God as the problem solver he was still doing a lot on his own behalf to solve the problems that were facing him however at the same time on the other side of the story Jacob at this time had been careful not to resort to the force of arms Now he had quite a retinue of servants and quite a number of sons and uh, it would have been a very tempting thing for him to turn aside and uh, arm these folk with swords and spears and bows and arrows to go out and meet Esau and his 400 men and at the same time of course he could with his great wealth have bought the services of mercenaries to also come and fight in his army against his angry brother but we do find that Jacob had advanced so far that he did not in any sense of the word turn to this source of protection and look to God as the one who would save him from this disastrous situation which of course uh, again parallels the experience of God's folk in the very last days when we will have discarded the weapons of force but not entirely the disposition to save ourselves now this move on Jacob's part proved to be totally unsuccessful it did not impress the brother in the least degree and therefore is entirely a waste of time and a waste of good uh, of good what we call it money but it was actually of course stock oxen, asses, flocks and men servants uh, that was, he sent a, a, a generous uh, uh, gift it doesn't specify what it was actually but it was a, a generous gift to his brother with the statement I have oxen and asses flocks and men servants and so forth but the servants returned with the tidings that Esau was approaching with 400 men and no response was sent to the friendly message it appeared certain that he was coming to seek revenge terror pervaded the, the camp Jacob was greatly greatly afraid and distressed. He could not go back and he feared to advance. His company, unarmed and defenceless, were wholly unprepared for a hostile encounter. 
as we're drawing a parallel between, of course, the experience of those folk back there and the experience of God's folk in the last days. I'll turn back again to the great controversy to note the statement in regard to the giving of the loud cry where in like manner God's folk will fear to go forward and yet at the same time will be unable to turn back. Page 608 to page 609. <clears throat> in this time of persecution, the faith of the Lord's servants will be tried. They have faithfully given the warning, looking to God and to his word alone. God's spirit moving upon their hearts has constrained them to speak, stimulate with holy zeal and with the divine impost on upon them they entered upon the performance of their duties without coldly calculating the consequences of speaking to the people the word which the Lord had given them now during the uh, bad cry period of course uh, each person will give what God gives him to give I turn back to uh, page 606 for a further confirmation of this where it talks about the beginning of the loud cry period whereas I've just been reading about the end of the same time and the statement says men of faith and prayer will be constrained to go forth with holy zeal declaring the words which God gives them no one will get their own message up no of that time will spend endless days now studying to get something up of their own they receive the truth from God and in turn give that truth to the people and then the Holy Spirit will bring back to our minds the things we've learned during these sessions spent together it came back to page 609 it goes on to say they have not consulted their temporal interests nor sought to preserve their reputation or their lives yet when the storm of opposition and, and reproach burst upon them some overwhelmed with consternation will be ready to exclaim had we foreseen the consequences of our words we would have held our peace they are hasty with difficulties Satan assails them with fierce temptations the work which they have undertaken seems far beyond their ability to accomplish they are threatened with destruction the enthusiasm which animated them is gone yet they cannot turn back just as Jacob could not turn back he feared to go forward the statement said but he, but he could not turn back As I read it again on page 196 he could not go back yet he feared to advance his company unarmed and defenceless were wholly unprepared for a hostile encounter he accordingly divided them into two bands and if one should be attacked the other might have an opportunity to escape he sent from his vast flocks generous presents to Esau with a friendly message he did all in his power to turn for the wrong to his brother and to avert the threatened danger and in humiliation and repentance he pleaded for divine protection thou says to me return to thy country and to thy kindred and I'll deal well with thee I am not worthy of the least of all thy mercies and of all the truth which thou hast showed unto thy servant for with my staff I passed over this Jordan and now I am become two bands deliver me I pray thee from the, band, from the hand of my brother from the hand of Esau for I fear him lest he will come and smite me and the mother with the children they are now reached the river Jabbok as night came on Jacob sent his family across the ford of the river while he alone remained behind he had decided to spend the night in prayer and he desired to be alone with God God could soften the heart of Esau in him was the patriarch's only hope and so I ask the question at this point did Jacob have a very real sense of need at this point of time yeah. right and that of course is always the basis of effective prayer because that's when we're driven to reach out after God's blessings as, as we otherwise would not be led to do now we're a little further be before we come down to the main point of our search in this particular respect today it was in a lonely mountainous region the haunt of wild beasts and the lurking place of robbers and murderers solitary and unprotected Jacob bowed in deep distress upon the earth it was midnight all that made life dear to him were at a distance exposed to danger and death the fact that it was midnight is quite significant and points forward to the great antitypical anti moment of time as you read on page 424 in the book Christ Object Lessons 
when as God's folk gradually do their final work it will be again the midnight hour the full to force uh, yes Christ will be lessons and the page is uh, page 415 uh, right page 414 not 424 414 what's the chapter's name chapters to meet the bridegroom the very last chapter in the book the very last chapter in the book uh, they don't have the page numbers in the bottom, the white page numbers. I, th I, think even, I think even the chapters are a bit different too in that particular edition. It always pays to... Uh, the real pages in the bottom in brackets. Oh, all right. What was it again? Two, two, four, two, four. The chapter's called To Meet the Bridegroom. What's the last chapter there called? It's right at the very end of the book. The very end of the book. Don't go on, you'll find it. Okay, in the, what's the last chapter called? Uh, here he comes. Yeah, right. 376. Look at 376. <coughs> in the parable, the wise virgins had oil in their vessels with their lamps. Their light burned with undimmed flame through the night of watching. It helped to swell the illumination for the bridegroom's honour. Shining out in the darkness, it helped to illuminate the way to the, the home of the bridegroom to the marriage feast. So the followers of Christ are to shed light into the darkness of the world. Through the Holy Spirit, God's word is a light as it becomes a transforming power in the life of the receiver. By implanting in their hearts the principles of his word, the Holy Spirit develops in men the attributes of God, the light of his glory, his character is to shine forth in his followers. Thus they are to glorify God to lighten the path of the bridegroom's home to the city of God to the marriage supper of the Lamb. The coming of the bridegroom was at midnight, the darkest hour. So the coming of Christ will take place in the darkest period of this earth's history. It goes on to compare the days of Lot and Noah with what things will be like in this last period of time. But just as Jacob bowed down at midnight, so the coming of Christ or the coming of the bride will be at midnight, the darkest hour. <clears throat> I read now further, page 1967 in the book Patri Patriarchs and Prophets. All that made life dear to him were at a distance, exposed to danger and death. Bitterest of all was the thought that it was his own sin which had brought this peril upon the innocent. With earnest cries and tears he made his prayer before God. Suddenly a strong hand was laid upon him. He thought that an enemy was seeking his life and he endeavoured to wrest himself from the grasp of his assailant. In the darkness the two struggled for the mastery. Not a word was spoken but Jacob put forth all his strength and did not relax his efforts for a moment. While he was thus battling for his life, the sense of his guilt pressed upon his soul, his sins rose up before him to shut him out from God. But in his terrible extremity he remembered God's promises and his whole heart went out in, in entreaty for his mercy. The struggle continued until near the break of day when the stranger placed his finger upon Jacob's thigh and he was crippled instantly. The patriarch now discerned the character of his antagonist. He knew, the, he, knew the event, he knew that he had been in conflict with a heavenly messenger and this was why his almost superhuman effort had not gained the victory. It was Christ, the angel of the covenant, who revealed himself to Jacob. The patriarch was now disabled and suffering the keenest pain but he would not loosen his hold. All penitent and broken, he clung to the angel, he wept and made supplication, Hosea 12 verse 4, pleading for a blessing. He must have the assurance that his sin was pardoned. Physical pain was not sufficient to divert his mind from this object. His determination grew stronger, his faith more earnest and persevering until the very last. The angel tried to release himself. He urged, let me go for the day breaketh. But Jacob answered, I will not let thee go except thou bless me. Right, now we now come to the point where we're ready to study in more detail, now depth and detail, what the counterpart of the struggle was that went on between Jacob and Jesus Christ personally. This was not even an ordinary angel. It was the angel of the covenant, Jesus Christ, who had come down and fought with Jacob from midnight until the break of day. From the darkest hour 
to the dawning of a new day altogether. And it was to be a new day for Jacob, of course, because from that time on his life was greatly changed and blessed for the better. Now in the first case, even though Jacob, even if Jacob had been assailed or, or set upon by a robber, a brigand, a, uh, a, a mugger or a bash, whatever else you might have to call such a person out there in those wild places, should he have, should he have tried to have met force with force? No, he shouldn't, should he? Which indicates, of course, <clears throat> that there still remained in Jacob at least a residue of the old human problem-solving elements. It was still there to a certain extent. First of all, we read in the previous page how he had sought to placate his brother by sending along conciliatory messages and by sending him vast presents from his, um, or, or, or considerable presents from his vast flocks and herds. And he had done all in his power to solve the problem by making his brother aware that he was not coming back to threaten his life as, as Esau thought he was. And that, of course, completely failed because the effect upon Esau was quite... Um, there was, just, there was just no effect and nothing, there was no change in Esau's hostile attitude toward his brother and no change in Esau's intent to take his brother's life and the life of all his retinue of wives, children and servants and to take over possession of his flocks and herds and add them to the wealth which he had already gotten from his father. So those efforts upon Jacob's um, part had failed and furthermore his effort to overmaster his assailant also completely failed. So the struggle from uh, midnight until the early hours of the morning when the sun began to break in the eastern sky did not give Jacob the physical victory he sought to gain by that process, but it did work in him eventually a very wonderful deliverance from that old spirit of self-salvation, that old attempt to try and save himself by his own efforts. Now, of course, we find that the problem as far as Jacob is concerned was quite complex. In the first case, he'd gone there to pray to um, gain strength and assurance from God in regard to his brother's planned onslaught the next day. That's what he'd gone to the desert for, and now comes a total distraction as this assailant comes to work on him to, to fight with him until the breaking of the day. And I'm sure Jacob decided to get this battle over so he'd get back to praying for deliverance and strength from his brother Esau. <clears throat> now, in like manner in the last days, the people of God will also have a, a compounded situation in which, in which a number of things will be happening at once, each of which is more than enough by themselves. <clears throat> now, first of all, God's folk will not know the transition point between the experience of Joshua and the angel in the, in the judgment of the living and the the continuation of that experience in the setting of Jacob's trouble they will not know when their sins have all been forgiven and when the sins will have been taken by Christ in order to have them placed upon the scapegoat they won't know that point of time in fact not even Satan knows when the judgment in heaven has been completed and the seven last plagues are actually in process of, of, of falling now, this may sound a little strange to us but we do have statements which assure us of that fact that uh, not even Satan that greatest of all Bible students upon this earth will know when the cases of God's people have been at last uh, completed and you see I find the statement in the book Great Controversy where um, Sister White plainly says this in regard to um, the people of God in these last days um You stand secret. I'll go back to my old book, and it's much easier, of course, to find in that book. But Sister White plainly says Satan does not know that their sins have been forgiven, and uh, but he infers that they possibly have been, and because of this, he works very hard to destroy them. I think it's here on page six one eight. <clears throat> right. He, it says as follows. As Satan influenced Esau to march against Jacob, so he will stir up the wicked to destroy God's people in the time of trouble. And as he accused Jacob, he will urge his accusations against the people of God. He numbers the world as his subjects, but the little company who keep the commandments of God are resisting his supremacy. 
if he could blot them from the earth his triumph would be complete he sees that holy angels are guarding them and he infers that their sins have been pardoned but he does not know that their cases have been decided in the sanctuary above all right he doesn't know that now if he doesn't know that does he know probation is closed for certain no he doesn't if he doesn't know it well we know it we all know it either because we'll be, we'll be much less uh, informed than Satan will be we'll be for instance confined to some small corner of the earth where we cut off from all news broadcasts it's a bit like being in camp here what's been happening the last couple of days do you know I don't oh, who cares <laughs> who cares <laughs> when I left uh, USA a few days ago they were talking about world war a lot of folks are talking about world war well it hasn't happened yet fortunately <laughs> I think we'd hear the, I, I think we'd feel the shocks <coughs> but in any case um, we'll be isolated from all new services and we'll have no idea what's happening where Satan of course will know what's happening throughout the entire world and if he doesn't want all that information know that probation is closed then we certainly will not know it either now reading just a little bit further it says he has, he has an accurate knowledge of the sin which he has tempted them to commit and he presents these before God in the most exaggerated light representing this people to be just as deserving as himself of exclusion in the favour of God he declares that the Lord cannot in justice forgive their sins and yet destroy him and his angels he claims them as his prey and demands that they be given into his hands to destroy <clears throat> which is a strange act on Satan's part of course because he says they have sinned against God yet he will destroy them which, which is a mission on his part that God doesn't destroy after all otherwise he'd demand that God destroyed them but why should he destroy them because they've sinned against God and especially when the argument is if you destroy them <coughs> you destroy me of course you must destroy them which means if you destroy them you must destroy me but that, that of course is not the logic Satan pursues because his mind is so bent upon revenge that's all he can think about at that or any other time in the history of sin now as I was saying here are, the <clears throat> here are the people of God they do not know that the sanctuary service is over therefore they think they must still plead with God for deliverance from their, from their sins they must make certain that every sin is gone before under judgment and all they want to do at this time is to spend time on their knees pleading for a successful passage to the judgment and that's a full time job by itself isn't it? It, it it'll be something which will fully occupy our attention and time then now if that was not enough Satan is there marshalling the entire world against us to destroy us just as Jacob found Esau advancing against him and at the same time we find that God will be trying to do a work in us a work of cleansing in us beyond the work of cleansing achieved through the latter rain and the work before the close of probation and we'll be fighting against God at the same time we'll be praying to have our sins completely taken care of and at the same time we'll be facing the combined onslaught of the wicked uh, who are coming against us to destroy us so we'll be kind of a very busy people won't we any one of those things will be enough without all of them being lumped together at that time and I can imagine how Jacob back there was desperately anxious to overcome his assailant probably kill him maybe and leave his body there in, in the desert when he got back to the business of praying to gain from God the assurance of forgiveness for sins and deliverance from the hand of Esau instead of that we find him fighting now Jesus came down to struggle with Jacob in order to produce in him a change to bring to him a realization of what the basic cause of his trouble was and to deliver him forever from that disposition to take into his own hands the task of fulfilling God's promises for him and that naturally must give to us some kind of an idea of the struggle for which we shall go during Jacob's trouble now come back to this point on page 197 in the book Patriarchs and Prophets it says but um, while he was thus battling for his life the sense of his guilt pressed upon his soul his sins rose up before him to shut him out from God in other words the memory of all those sins committed the memory of the sad mistakes he's made the memory of how he tried so hard to work out solutions to his problems all those things rose up before him to shut him out from the presence of God and to break his faith in God and the one saving factor was this 
that in his terrible extremity he remembered God's promises and his whole heart went out in entreaty for his mercy. In other words, through those promises, Jacob knew the saving power of God. He knew the mercy and love of God. He knew what God had promised he would do and now, instead of trying to work out a way to save himself, he was putting his trust completely in those promises, resting in those promises and depending upon the, the word of God in those promises. And uh, the more desperate his plight became, the more he rested in those promises, the less and less he trusted in himself, until finally at the break of day, in the beginning of the new day, then the Lord touched his thigh and crippled him. So he was now helpless and suffering the keenest pain. Now people often ask me the question, well, what did that mean? Just in a few minutes we'll look and see. The patriarch was now disabled and suffering the keenest pain, but he would not loosen his hold. And that's when he laid hold upon God and said, I will not let you go except you bless me. The next paragraph then says, Jacob had power over the angel and prevailed. Through humiliation, repentance and self-surrender, this sinful, erring mortal prevailed with the majesty of heaven. He had fastened his trembling grasp upon the promises of God and the heart of infant love could not turn away the sinner's plea. Now, let's now see the final result. The error which had led to Jacob's sin in obtaining the birthright by four was now clearly set before him. He had not trusted God's promises, but sought by his own efforts to bring about that which God would have accomplished in his own time and way. Now, that's, that is what God brought Jacob through as a result of that night of struggling on the mountaintop, or I should say by the brook, it wasn't so much a mountaintop, but beyond the brook Jabbok, in the darkness of the night and obviously then as Jesus Christ struggled with Jacob because it was a physical battle but it has a um, very definite spiritual counterpart in the antitype <clears throat> that the purpose of this struggle was to bring Jacob to the place where he saw his sin in his true light and was led to give that sin up forever does that give us a clue as to what that cleansing work would be for us during, the, during Jacob's trouble Let's now look at the situation here on the blackboard today, or the whiteboard, I should better call it. Blackboard's a thing of the past now, in most places anyway. Now, first of all, <clears throat> we begin with the new birth experience, and at the new birth experience, we have what we, what we shall call cleansing number one. At the new birth, there is cleansed away from us the um, NB just for new birth. There is a cleansing at that point when God removes from us the presence of the old man called the carnal nature, the stony heart, and so forth. It's the offspring of Satan. Now there follows the new birth, the work of reformation. Just for our for reformation. Now does the work of reformation also affect a cleansing in the experience of the believer? Right? So once again we have, I just put C now for another cleansing in the work of Reformation. New birth, we have a cleansing there. Now, now the work of Reformation comes to its peak during the period of the loud cry or the latter rain, I'll, I'll put the word here, latter rain. And during the latter rain, as you read in Testaments to Ministers, page 506, there is a further cleansing work goes forward. And that further cleansing work brings us to the place where every sin has been removed. The last trace of sinfulness is taken away by the work of the latter rain. So we enter the time, we come to the close of probation with every sin confessed and forsaken and thus we, are, we, we have attained spotless perfection so far as righteousness or removal of sinfulness is concerned and we are now ready for translation, right? At that point we're ready for translation. But we're not yet ready to win the battle with the man, man of sin. And there's another cleansing process goes on during Jacob's trouble, of which I shall now read in, from the book uh, uh, The Great Controversy again. <clears throat> page 621, if you have the book. <clears throat> Great Controversy, page 621. And the statement says, it's the first main paragraph on the page of which there are two Jacob's history is also an assurance that God will not cast off those who have been deceived and tempted and betrayed into sin 
but who have returned unto him with true repentance. While Satan seeks to destroy this class, God will send his angels to comfort and protect them in a time of, of peril. The assaults of Satan are fierce and determined. His delusions are terrible. But the Lord's eyes upon his people and his ear listens to their cries. Their affliction is great. The flames of the furnace are about to consume them. But the refiner will bring them forth as gold tried in the fire. God's love for his children during this period of their severest trial is as strong and tender as in the days of their sunniest prosperity. But it is needful for them to be placed in the furnace of fire. Their earthliness must be consumed that the image of Christ may be perfectly reflected. Now the reference there, of course, is to Malachi, the third chapter. Let's um, turn to it, Malachi chapter 3, and note the role of Jesus Christ as the refiner and purifier of silver. Malachi, the last book in the Old Testament, the third chapter, verses 1 to 3. <coughs> The Lord here says, "Behold, I will send my messenger before my uh, uh, pardon. I'll send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me," saith the Lord. And the Lord whom you seek shall suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant, whom you delight in. Behold, he shall come," saith the Lord of hosts. But who may abide the day of his coming? And who shall stand when he appeareth? For he is like a refiner's fire, and like fuller's soap. And he shall sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. And he shall purify the sons of Levi and purge them as gold and silver that they may offer unto the Lord an offering in righteousness. Now the imagery here is of a refiner and purifier of silver. In other words, from the mountain there is drawn out the ore in which the precious metals are, are to be found. They're placed in the crucible a fierce fire is lit beneath the crucible and the melting process, th process then goes on. The ore, the silver ore, melts and runs out from the, from the rock, the slag, which then flows to the surface being lighter than the silver and the silversmith carefully skims off the dross as it comes to the surface. And of course as the process goes on the work becomes closer and closer and finer and finer and the particles coming to the surface become smaller and smaller. Until at last the silver, the refiner of silver can look upon the surface of the molten metal and see his face perfectly reflected in that, in that, in that, on that, from that surface. And when he sees a perfect reflection, then what does he know about the purity of the metal? It's been achieved, right? It is now a pure product and ready to be poured out for use in whatever way they plan to use it, making coins or ornaments or using photography, whatever the case may be. Now these verses are applied by, the, by Sister White first of all to the work of Jesus Christ when he came to the most holy place back in 1844. And you read about that on page 425 in the book Great Controversy. We might add here to our list then of course um, <clears throat> other cleansing processes or break down the work of Reformation into two cleansing processes the ministry of the first department and the ministry of the second department most of the second part of the course being in particular the latter rain and the loud cry experience. But beyond the close of probation, the, the statement still applies during the period of Jacob's trouble and during that time we find that there is a further cleansing work goes on when Jesus Christ continues to sit as a refiner and a purifier of silver during Jacob's trouble. So here is the refiner. Now during this time, what is to be removed from God's people? Sin? No. Earthliness. Right? Earthliness is to be removed from God's people during this time. And we now need, of course, to understand just what earthliness actually is. Now another statement, unfortunately I don't have with me the Review and Heralds, and uh, no one here seems to have them. I've asked around a little bit, and no one seems to have them, but... Um, the statement in the review and held of August 12, 1884, August 12, 1884, where um, words such as these words such as these are to be found, and there Sister White says that um, 
the experience of the time of Jacob's trouble will do for God's faith what nothing else can do. It will, I just forgot the exact words now, but where's the effect that it will finally divorce us completely from sympathy with Satan, sympathy with him. Now, sympathy with Satan is possible for a Christian without making that person to be a sinner. And that's proved by the fact that during the 4,000 years prior to the cross of Calvary, the loyal angels up in heaven still retain a certain sympathy with Satan, not just for him, but with him. And not until the cross of Calvary was that, was that bond of sympathy finally broken. If you like the reference which um, confirms that fact, you turn to Desire of Ages and the reference is uh, page 761, I believe. 761 in the book Desire of Ages. Well, Sister White says, At the cross of Calvary, the last link of sympathy between Satan and the heavenly world was broken. Page 761 is correct. Which means, of course, there was a link of sympathy between Satan and the heavenly world up until the cross of Calvary. Yet that did not make those angels to be sinful, but simply uh, sympathetic. They, they had big questions in their minds as to whether after all God had been just in expelling Satan from heaven, whether after all Satan might not have found some genuine faults in the character of God, whether after all there was not some need for reformation of the heavenly government. But when they saw Satan's behaviour at the cross of Calvary and they saw Christ's exhibition of God's wonderful love, then they knew for certain what the real truth in the matter was and the last link of sympathy between Satan and the heavenly world was then broken. Now, <clears throat> if it was not until the end of the struggle that Jacob finally understood the real Sabbath rest principles and so the true nature of uh, his struggle against God up until that point of time, then what does this mean so far as our parallel experience is concerned? Likewise, right? Likewise. It also means very obviously that the more today we enter into the practice of the Sabbath rest principles, the more we totally abandon any role as a problem solver, the more we give up any work of trying to establish ourselves and make something of ourselves and, and simply put ourselves at God's disposal as holy men and women, then the kinder that period is going to be. And of course the ultimate uh, objective is to sleep in the bottom of the boat as Jesus did. Right? Asleep in the bottom of the boat. While those disciples were fearful and afraid as they tried to bring that boat to shore, as they were desperately trying to save themselves, as they completely forgot about the simple question of what are our orders and what are the promises, and forgot to obey the one and believe the other, they certainly were exhibiting earthliness. Now, specifically, what is earthliness? In the context of uh, what we've read today from the experience of Jacob, both from Patriarchs and Prophets and Great Controversy, earthliness obviously is that disposition to put the saving of your own life first and foremost. To forget, right, to forget our orders and to forget that God himself is responsible for taking care of our lives and we only have to worry about doing what he commands us to do. And that's why I greatly appreciate the commission given to Jeremiah that he, that he taught only what God gave him to teach and he went only where God sent him. And that will always be the case with every person whom God calls to give a message at any time down through this world's history. Now, <clears throat> if you think today about um, the purifying work of trials and tribulations, and if we examine our own minds at the present time, we will find that we don't really make much room in our thinking for a life of trials and suffering. We think of, we think of Jesus Christ as one who, who is responsible for always making sure that our way is easy and we are delivered from trials. If we get sick, what do we expect God to do? Heal us. If we have... If we have uh, some kind of um, uh, difficulties and problems, what do we expect God to do? Properly solve those things, make our way straight and easy. And we, th we tend to think of God as one who is the problem solver and plan maker, whose one duty is to make sure that all our problems are solved, all our difficulties are taken away and so forth. Now certainly that is God's role. But remember, there are times when God 
permits us to suffer if we will accept the suffering. And I'm sure lots of trials we escape because we, we, we're just not willing to endure those trials. And we, our minds are conditioned not to accept trials and tribulations and difficulties as any part of God's plan for us whatsoever. Our minds are conditioned that way. For instance, let's, let's go again to the story of David. Uh, the life of David has always been to me a very, very great and wonderful comfort. And as you know, David, of course, um, during the period of time when uh, Saul was chasing him, certainly had a life of suffering, of hardship, of setbacks, and it seemed as if um, while God did preserve him alive, that um, his fugitive experience was anything but a very pleasant one, and he longed to be free of this. So there came a time at last on page 672 in the book Patriarchs and Prophets when David despaired of a reconciliation with Saul it seemed inevitable that he should at last fall a victim to the malice of the king and he determined again to seek refuge in the, hand of, in the land of the Philistines. With 600 men under his command he passed over to Achish, the king of Gath. Now I think it's quite significant that the uh, statement here says there were 600 men under his command he went across to the king of Gath. What does the number six always indicate in the Bible? Man, man right? It's, it's, it's manpower and there's also the period of probationary time for man, the period of man's power, man's rulership. And so when David made this decision, the decision which came from himself because he was unwilling to endure the discipline and hardship of staying back in his own country, as the next paragraph goes on to say. David's conclusion that Saul would certainly accomplish his murderous purpose was formed without the counsel of God. All right, so who was the plan maker? Okay. David was. Even while Saul was plotting and seeking to accomplish his, his destruction, the Lord was working to secure David the kingdom. God works out his plans that are humanized our veiled in mystery. Men cannot understand the ways of God, and looking at appearances, they interpret the trials and tests and provings that God permits to come upon them as things which are against them, and it will only work their ruin. Now, let's, let's, this is the key sentence that will help us to understand what we have to overcome during Jacob's trouble. It says, We do not understand the ways of God. And then what happens? We look at appearances, we interpret the trials and tests and provings that God permits to come upon us as things which are against us. Now when it's against you, what do you do with them? You fight against them. Isn't that right? When you think that something's against you, you fight against it. Now when Christ came down to fight, to, to, to meet with Jacob, had Christ come down to be against Jacob that night or for him? For him. But what did Jacob think, this, this unknown person? He was against. Right. Right. Jacob thought he was against, so when he thought he was against, what did he do? He fought against him. Now if we sit down today and very, very carefully analyze our attitude toward the trials and difficulties which come against us, when we think of what we expect of God, and even what the Sabbath rest message has led us to, to expect from God, I have to admit that um, the things I welcome and the nice thing God does, does for me, but the things I don't welcome so much as the unnice things He does for me. <laughs> <laughs> or permits to get upon me, I should more accurately say. <clears throat> I guess there's no such word as unnice anyway, but the unpleasant things that, uh, that the Lord permits to come against me or upon me, and... Um, I have to come to the place where, where I am so totally submissive to God's will that when God permits hardship and sacrifice and trial to come to me, instead of, instead of resisting that, I, I praise God because I know this thing is for me, not against me. And knowing it's for me, I can then welcome pain and suffering, even sickness and even death if need be. I'm getting... Got ahead of me this time, didn't it? Hmm. <laughs> I have to stop I guess about now but um, we'll develop this thought as we move on into our next study period and, um, and demonstrate the fact that there is a great work yet to be done for us and will not be fully accomplished until we have come to the end of the time of Jacob's trouble so let's stop right then until we come back again in a few minutes time <clears throat> I'll ask you to ask your questions in the next study period rather than this one so if you have any to ask just keep in mind because I'm sure that next study period will answer some of those questions for you now 20 minutes past 3 or 21 minutes past 3 let's take a 15 minute break and come back at uh, 25 minutes to 4 for our